Okay, so welcome to Chile and uh, we have David Conlon from Caltech who's going to talk about random multilinear maps and the Irish box problem. Okay, so I'm going to give, well, what I hope will be a fairly gentle talk about extremal numbers. Um, extremal numbers are one of my favorite topics and I'm basically just going to talk about one thing that I did last year with Cosman uh, Poata and Dmitry Zakharov. Um, okay, so let me just start from the basics and we'll, we'll build up from there. So I'm going to be interested in the extremal number and ultimately I'm going to be interested in the extremal number for uh, de-uniform hypergraphs. So by this, I mean the largest number of edges in uh, a de-uniform hypergraph on n vertices uh, with no copy of H. Uh, sorry, on n vertices with uh, no H. And H is itself assumed to be a de-uniform hypergraph. Okay, so um, normally in the literature, we talk about just the ordinary extremal number. The ordinary extremal number is just usually for graphs um, and we don't generally write the subscript when we're talking about, about graphs. So um, here the, the question is, sometimes people say it's fully solved and in, in some sense it is sort of fully solved, but I'll explain why that's not the case in a minute. So, so there's a classical theorem of Erdős and uh, Stone, and then an additional observation by Erdős and Shimonovic, which um, resulted in the following theorem. So basically the extremal number for graphs is equal to one minus one over the chromatic number, minus one, plus some small correction term, times the total possible number of edges in a graph, which is n choose two. So, so in particular, if, uh, if H were just a triangle, then the chromatic number is three in that case. So what we get here is actually a half, um, which agrees with what you expect because you can split a graph into two pieces of size n over two, put the edges between and it contains no triangle. Um, there, there are sharper versions where you don't have to deal with this little low one in that case. But. Okay, this, this basically answers the question, except in what's called the degenerate case. So, um, so the degenerate case is um, when the chromatic number is equal to two. And in that case, what do we get out of this Erdős Stone Shimonovic? We get, so this ESS implies that XNH is little o of n squared in that case, just because this, this expression is just one, so we get one minus one, that all cancels, and we just get a little o one term. Um, okay, but you might want to do better than that. So, um, and actually there are better known results than that. So actually there's a result of um, our theorem of Kuvari, Shosh, and uh, Turan from the 50s. Yeah. It goes there. Um, where they actually show that you can get a power saving. So, so for all uh, bipartite H, because chromatic number uh, two is the same as saying that you're bipartite. For all bipartite H, um, there exists some delta of H greater than naught, such that the extremal number in this case is big O of n to the two minus delta. So, so you can always actually get a power saving rather than just a, a little o n squared term. All right. So there are loads of open problems about extremal numbers. Um, some of which, like Jacob earlier today, I mentioned something called the compactness conjecture. Let me just mention just a couple of these. So there's lots of these attractive open problems. Um, here's, uh, here's one. So for all bipartite H, in fact, you don't need to put in bipartite there, um, there exists some rational number such that the extremal number of NH is equal to um, theta, so just up to some constant, times n to the r. So this is a, a conjecture of Erdős and Shimonovich, which is completely wide open. Um, 
So very, very little is known about it. We know some families for which we actually are able to pin down the extremal number. And for those families, it does actually satisfy, or for the ones that we know, it does actually satisfy this, um, this conjecture. Um, but apart from knowing it from a few examples, we don't really have any good evidence for, for this conjecture. There's also the converse conjecture that for, um, for all rationals um, uh, between one and two, the, uh, there exists a bipartite H such that exactly the same thing, the extremal number is equal to theta of, of n to the r. This uh, reverse conjecture, um, sometimes they're both referred to as the rational exponents conjecture, has actually seen a lot of work recently. Um, so for example, um, so proved for families by myself and Boris Pook. Um, but there's been loads of special cases. So uh, now known for, for many, um, or sorry, let's never into that for many or an element of Q. Um, I won't try and state, there's actually been probably about a dozen papers in the last three or four years about this, um, expanding the range for which, for which this is known. Um, and the conjecture mentioned earlier by, uh, by Jacob, if you were at his talk, is what's called compactness conjecture. And all of these conjectures, um, all of these that I've stated are actually uh, due to Erdős and Shimonovich. Um, the compactness conjecture says that the extremal number of, if you take two graphs, H1 and H2, then their extremal number is omega of the minimum of the two. So, um, so that basically the, the omega, the implied constant just depends on the two graphs, but essentially the conjecture is that, um, that the smaller extra of the extremal number is determines the joint extremal number. Um, again, I see no good evidence for this. It's not true for hypergraphs. It's, um, uh, Jacob said earlier, we disproved it very recently for linear equations. Um, it seems hard to disprove, but, um, yeah, give it time. All right, anyway, uh, what I'm actually gonna talk about today is not any of these things. I kind of just wanted to mention um, these things because they show that this is at least a, a rich and interesting area. What I actually want to talk about is a very classical problem, um, which is referred to as the Erdős box problem. So, all right, so this particular graph, H is equal to K2222 um, D times. So, so this is a de-uniform hypergraph where there are d parts. Each part has two vertices. And then you take all of the possible edges that take one vertex from, from each part. So, so there are two d vertices and there are two to the power of d um, edges. All right, so, and the question we're gonna be interested in, and this really does go back to, to a paper of Erdős, is determine the extremal number um, for d uniform hypergraphs of n, k, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, and so on. Um, all right, and I'll just assume, obviously, that this, that, that this occurs, um, that this occurs d times there. All right, uh, so this is a classic question. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the Erdős box problem, and the reason it's referred to as the Erdős box problem is that it's equivalent to the following. Um, or it's equivalent up to a constant anyway, to the following. Uh, what is the largest number of points in um, n to the d? So, so this n is just a shorthand for, uh, for the set one of down, uh, containing no uh, d-dimensional box, containing uh, no d-dimensional box. And what I mean by that is that we don't contain the vertices of a d-dimensional box. Um, this is completely equivalent. And again, sorry, I should explain, the d-dimensional box has to be axis parallel as well. So, and it's not a, a square either. You're allowing um, rectangular cuboids, basically. Um, okay, but with all those caveats, basically this question of determining 
what is the largest number of points in n to the d with no d-dimensional box is completely equivalent to, to this question here. Um, so it's pretty easy to see that this is the case. There is a thing. So if, for example, you actually wanted the sides of the box to all be the same, then it's, it's much more a multi-dimensional Samoretti problem, which is a totally different ballgame entirely. Um, OK. So because of this, anyway, um, this is sometimes referred to as uh, the box problem or the Erdős box problem. Um, there are statements in analysis as well that are also very close to this and also referred to as the box problem. OK, so this is the question that I want to look at. The, the first case is actually extremely basic. So, um, so the first case is when d equals 2. And in that case, what we're interested in is what is the extremal number of k22. And the extremal number of k22 is just the same thing as the extremal number of a cycle of length 4. Um, OK. So, so in this case, um, we know on the one hand, that the extremal number of C4 is big O of n to the 3 halves. In fact, you can do uh, something much more precise than that. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So this is a result. Uh, again, this is Kuvari, Shosh, and Turan from the 50s. So this is 1954. And a lower bound, so um, knowing that it's omega of n to the 3 halves, this is a lower bound that strangely goes back to Klein and actually predates the upper bound. It's in a, an Erdős paper from 1938. He's, he has the construction that gives this, um, and it actually predates people looking at this, this C4 question, but it's, it's somehow completely equivalent. Um, in practice, this is one of the few cases where we not only know um, it up to constants, but we even know what the leading term is. So, so it's known, and it takes a little bit more work, um, that the extremal number of C4 is a half plus little o1 times n to the 3 halves. And again, in certain cases, for certain values of n, we even know really exactly what it is um, due to some results of Faraday. But um, I, won't, I won't really go into that. OK, so we know that the answer here for, for d equals 2 is, is n to the 3 halves. So what happens if we go up to d equals 3? So, OK, so for d equals 3, there's a result of Erdős from the 60s. So the result of Erdős from the 50s is that this is big O of n cubed minus a quarter. Um, and, and this is Erdős. And I forget exactly what year, maybe 64. Um, on the other hand, the lower bound the best that's known here, uh, doesn't actually agree with this. So it's omega of n cubed minus a third. So it's a third instead of a quarter off from, from, uh, from three. And this is a result of uh, Krop, uh, Nets Katz, and Magioni from 2002. And it's not a particularly easy construction. It's actually several pages long. It involves some clever ideas. Their motivation was actually a problem in analysis and harmonic analysis. Um, so that's actually still, and even everything I'm going to talk about today does not impinge upon the d equals three case. So this is still the best that's actually known in the, the d equals three case. Okay. Let me now move to what happens for, for general d. So, so for general d, we have that the extremal number of k2222 um, is big O of n to the d minus uh, 1 over 2 to the power of d minus 1. And again, this is actually a result of it's from the same paper by Erdős. Um, and it's, it's a nice thing. Basically, so the, all of the upper bounds are always some double counting. And there's some fairly simple double counting operation. In higher dimensions, you have to apply that double counting argument multiple times, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, what about lower bounds? OK, so uh, classically, the best lower bound, and this is quite easy, is that this is omega of n to the d minus d divided by 
two to the power of d minus one. So sorry, just to distinguish, that's d minus one in the exponent. This minus one is actually down, down here. And I don't know if that's actually due to anybody. Um, it follows from a probabilistic deletion argument. All right, so probabilistic deletion arguments are fairly standard, but let me actually go, go into this. So essentially, what we do is we look at a random graph. So a random hypergraph. So let's look at um, GNP, um, the you know, GNPD, which is a random hypergraph with n vertices where we're choosing each edge with probability p. Then the expected number of edges in this is, well, each edge occurs with probability p, and the total number of edges, let's be a bit approximate and not worry too much. There's a round n to the d. Um, it's actually n choose d, but, but let's not worry too much. Um, the expected number of copies of this k22222 is equal to p to the power of the number of edges times n to the power of the number of vertices. Now, the number of edges is two to the power of d. The number of vertices is just two d. Okay, so that's all we have. If we have, we take um, a random graph, a random hypergraph with probability p, then we have p n to the d edges, and we have p to the two d n to the two d copies of k two 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 two. Now, if we're in a situation where the number of edges is larger than the number of copies of k two 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 then we can actually just delete one edge from each of these to delete all of these and still be left with, with lots of, of edges. So, um, so uh, we can remove the K2222 if uh, the number of edges is significantly larger or even just twice the number of K2222s. Um, okay, but the expected number of edges minus the expected number of K2222s is P n to the D minus P to the 2D n to the 2D. And that is um, greater than say P over two n to, n to the D, if and only if P is around what we were looking for. So it's n to the minus D divided by two to the D minus one. So, um, so this is a very simple argument, very, very standard, but you'll see later why exactly I'm doing this. The key point, the one that I actually want to, uh, to mark is that the reason I'm doing this is exactly because of this. I want to reach a point where the number of copies of K22 is less than the number of edges because I am removing one edge from each of these copies in order to get rid of all of them. And for that, I need that the number of copies of K222 be less than the, the number of edges. So, um, David, so actually, I have a quick question. Hopefully. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, uh, it, it's obvious that one should also consider trying other probabilistic, standard probabilistic techniques like the Lovas local lemma mm -hmm. or the box free process. If, uh, um, uh, what happens for those? So, the local lemma actually has this annoying feature that if you just apply the local lemma naively, it looks like it does better but you need to track the probability that you, you still have enough edges. So, um, so one way to do that is to color the edges instead of picking one subgraph, and that would guarantee can, that one of them would be large enough. You can do that, but it basically gives the same bound. Um, ah, okay. So this is the thing. The, all right, so if you do the box, pro, sorry, the box free process, it will give some extra log factor, um, I'm fairly sure. Has anybody actually done this? Maybe it's probably implicit in some paper where they've, they've done some of these. So I can't remember all of the different ones. People have done it for general graphs and maybe in the general graph context, it also goes through for the general hypergraph context. But, but anyway, all of that's kind of irrelevant because um, it has actually been, well, partly been improved by a polynomial factor. And actually the main result here is that you can improve it by a polynomial factor as well, so. So actually, the first thing I wanted to mention is a result of Gunderson, Rödel, and Sidorenko. So, um, so um, this is actually a very, very nice result. Um, Gunderson, Rödel, and Sidorenko. 
from about 1999. Okay, so, um, so for any d greater than or equal to two, let's let SD be the smallest positive integer, positive S, and actually I have to put this in if it exists, uh, such that the expression S times D minus one times two to the D minus one is an integer. Then if that's true, the extremal number of N K2, two, 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 two um, is omega of N to the D minus S, sorry, I'm getting that the wrong around, uh, D minus one over S divided by two to the D minus one. So basically, you can improve by a tiny amount, but it's still a polynomial factor, but it's an absolutely tiny amount. So if there exists some s such that this weird looking expression is an integer, then I can subtract this out of the exponent. So before, the probabilistic lower bound gives just this, but I can actually get an extra tiny factor if there's an s that satisfies, that satisfies this. Um, so, so this gives an extra polynomial factor in certain cases. However, it doesn't always give an extra polynomial factor. So, um, so this, uh, here's a remark. This actually fails if uh, d and two to the d minus one have a common factor. So it fails for, um, the first case it fails is when d is equal to six. So it fails for six, 12, 18. It actually, once you once it fails for some number, it actually fails for all multiples of that number. That's easy to check because if D and two to the D minus one share a factor, then KD and two to the KD minus one also share a factor. But it's also false for other things. It's false for 20, it's false for 21 and so on and so forth. It's actually, it's false for an infinite number of, of D. Um, I don't actually know what the density is, um, but it does fail for, for an infinite number of D. Okay. Um, so what our main result is, let me actually state the result before talking a little bit about the proofs. Um, our main result improves this. So this is again with uh, Kosman Powata and Dmitry Zakharov, and I think it should probably be published this year, um, is that for any D greater than or equal to two, uh, let O and S, be such that um, d times s minus one is less than two to the d minus one times or. Then in that particular case, uh, the extremal number of again d n k2222 is omega of um, n to the d minus or over s. Okay. So again, it's some technical condition, but let me actually try and uh, explain where this technical, sorry, what this technical condition gives. In fact, in practice, we just take or equals one. So, um, so here's, uh, uh, let me just actually state it as a corollary. Um, so corollary um, is that actually the extremal number D of N K2222 is omega of n to the d minus, and again, it looks like a ridiculous thing, but it's two to the d minus one divided by d, C-linked, and then flipped. So again, for comparison, what we had there before was d divided by two to the d minus one. Now I'm taking one over that, which is never an integer. I'm rounding it up um, and then flipping it back again. So, um, so actually what you end up with is always an improvement. It turns out that, that this is always an improvement of this. Basically we've, we've rounded its reciprocal up. Um, so, so this follows from the theorem with R equals one and uh, S equals two to the D minus one over D. 
Um, I won't go through how this how this actually goes through, but essentially that's that's what happens. Um, and the key thing about this is that it always improves on the probabilistic deletion argument. Uh, and actually, it also um, improves on Gunderson, Rodel, and Sidorenko, unless d is itself a power of k. I'm oh, sorry, power of two. So actually, um, the Gunderson, Rodel, Sidorenko already gives the sharp bound for C4. Um, and we don't, it gives, whatever it gives, we can't improve for d is 4, d is 8, d is 16. But every other, in every other case, we, we improve this. Okay. Um, so it's this tiny improvement. Um, it does, however, improve over, um, like Jacob was suggesting, this box-free process. It gives an extra polynomial. And the reason why this is interesting, um, so I feel like this, this does justify or need some, some justification, is in some sense it's just interesting in its own right because it seems hard in general to shift bounds for extremal numbers from the probabilistic deletion argument. But, um, but here's a result, which I, I won't state formally, but it's a theorem of, um, uh, of Asaf Ferber, uh, Gwyneth McKinley, who's here with us, and uh, Wojciech Samuti. And the theorem essentially says the following. Um, if for a given d partite, uh, d uniform h, one can improve by a polynomial on the probabilistic deletion argument. Then actually you can count the number of copies. Then you can count the number of H-free hyperclass on N vertices. So to me, this is quite a surprising result. So there's, a, there's another classical question, which is basically, so for example, um, if you have H is equal to C4, how many C4-free graphs are there on N vertices? And what this actually tells you um, is that, sorry, when you, if you improve by a polynomial on the deletion argument for the extremal number, is if you can actually take that deletion argument for extremal numbers, if you can improve that by a polynomial factor, then you automatically get a result telling you what the count of H-free hypergraphs is. Um, so because we've done that for these, um, for these boxes, these K2222s, we actually know that, so this is again in the paper with Cosman uh, and Dmitry Zakharov, we know that, um, so Fn K22222 is uh, less than or equal to two to the power of C times the extremal number of this K2222, where this Fn uh, H is the number of uh, labeled H free graphs or hypergraphs on N vertices. Um, I should say, sorry, I'm being uh, a little bit uh, imprecise here. So this is actually true for infinitely many N. Okay, but we don't really do any work here. So essentially the, the ferber mckinley samuti result is extremely general. All we need to do is actually say that we have a polynomial improvement. And once we have that polynomial improvement, no matter how small it is, then that polynomial improvement actually gives, um, gives this result. Why is this good? Because this is actually sharp or it's, it's sharp up to this constant C because for example, I can just start with any graph that has the extremal number of vertices or edges, and I can sample all of the possible subgraphs of that. And if I sample all the possible subgraphs, then I get um, at least two to the power of the extremal number of different graphs, um, which are, are H-free. 
So, um, so that little polynomial improvement actually allows us allows us to do this. Okay. So let me talk just a little bit briefly. I have about ten minutes or twelve minutes um, about what the methods are that go into this. Um, and let me start actually by explaining what the gunderson rodel sidorenko result is, how it works. So, um, so let me start with uh, gunderson rodel and sidorenko and let me also talk about what happens when d is equal to three. So, uh, what happens in the other cases is a sort of generalization of this. Okay. So, they produce graphs as follows. So our, their vertex sets are um, vertex bags U1, U2, and U3. They're all of the same size. So U1 is equal to U2 is equal to U3 and has size around Q to the power of S. Um, but U3 is itself a copy of FQ to the power of S. So, so the first two I don't care about. They're just label sets or they're just, just sets basically. The third one is actually a copy of this finite field to the power of S and Q is a prime power. All right. Um, if you do this, what's the edge set? So, um, so for each uh, U1 in U1 and uh, U2 in U2, pick uh, or hyperplanes, random hyperplanes. in uh, U3 and join U1, U2 to any point in their intersection. So essentially I'm taking a linear subspace of co-dimension R. So for each U1 and U2, I take a linear subspace of co-dimension R and I connect U1 and U2 to everything in that linear subspace. So I have, I have my set U1, I have my set U2, and I have my set U3, which is now a copy of, of FQ to the S. And for each U1 and U2 here, I connect them to a linear subspace over here. So, so this is a sort of a hyperplane corresponding to U1 and U2. Why is this a good thing to do? Um, so, if I'm trying to avoid a copy of K222, then the situation I have is that actually there's within here, there's U1 and there's U1 prime. Over here, there's U2 and U2 prime. And I want that the, basically the collection of edges connected to U1 and U2 is a hyperplane. The connection, the collection of edges connected to U1 prime U2 is also a different hyperplane. And so I get four different hyperplanes over here. So actually over here, I'm going to get, I won't try and draw them all. I'll get four different hyperplanes, four, sorry, four different linear subspaces. Those linear subspaces um, will intersect. And how will they intersect? Well, they'll intersect in a linear subspace. And linear subspaces will either be a single point, but it'll be either nothing at all, or a single point, or a line or itself a plane or so on, but basically it will also be a linear subspace. What we want is we want for the four hyperplanes corresponding to the four edges over here, we want their intersection to be a single point and we don't want them to form a line. Okay, so, so what can go wrong? Um, all right, so again, we have our pairs of points here um, and then for each pair of points, we have a, a hyperplane over here. Um, and what could happen, let me get rid of that, is that instead of intersecting in a point, they actually intersect in, in a line. So I'm getting four spaces that actually intersect in a line. If that's the case, then actually across these, um, so then let's form, let's look at, let's call these U1, U1 prime, U2, U2 prime. Then let's be interested in N, U1, U1 prime, 
due to U2 prime. And this is the number of K222s containing those points. Okay. So actually, it's either a single point. Um, so, or rather, yeah, okay. So, um, so either we get none of them. So if we get a single point, we don't actually get any K222s, or we get absolutely loads of them because each of these lines has size Q. So if there's more than one thing connected to each of these, these four um, lines back here, then we have uh, at least Q squared possibilities because we can pick any pair on this line. So actually, um, if um, there's at least, or rather, let me put it more succinctly, if n u1 up to u2 prime is greater than or equal to one, then that actually implies that n1 u1 up to u2 prime is at least q squared. So, so there's a jump up where you go automatically from having one thing to having loads of things. Okay. Um, why does this help us? It helps us because um, I'm going to try and do a probabilistic deletion argument again in this setting. So, um, so a deletion argument in this setting, um, it's a random graph, so we can look at the expected number of edges. It turns out that the expected number of edges is again, P times N to the D for appropriate P and N. So N is just the size of the sets, um, but P is some, some appropriate P. Okay. Um, the expected number of K222s is actually, so how many edges are there? There's eight edges. So it's actually P to the eight times N to the six, which is again, the same as it would be in a random graph. And this is kind of critical. It's a, it's a slightly subtle point, but it is possible to show that the expected number of edges is the same as in a random graph. And given that probability, the expected number of K222s is also the same as what it would be in a random graph. So it looks like we can just apply the deletion argument again. Um, and actually we can, we can apply the deletion argument again. It will give us, naively, it will give us the same thing that we got the previous time, um, which doesn't really help us. However, loads of these copies overlap with each other. So actually, if I look at um, this edge here, U1, U2, and I connect it up to here, and basically what I do is I delete every edge containing U1 and U2. So I delete all of these, then delete all Q of those edges. By deleting Q of those edges, I've actually deleted Q squared different copies of K2222. Because across these four, I know that there's at least Q squared of these. And just by deleting the ones that are connected to here, I've actually deleted way more than I should have. So in the previous deletion argument, when I didn't have any structure, I had to delete exactly one edge from each copy of K222. Here, I'm allowed, because they're all bunched up together, there's a more efficient way to actually remove. So basically, by just removing everything on that line connected back to U1, U2, I've deleted Q squared possible copies of K222 for a cost of Q. And that is what allows me to save. Um, so, so that's what happens in this gunderson rudel sidorenko argument. OK, all right. Is, is that why you're counting K222s that extend instead of K221s? Yes, exactly, yeah. OK. Yeah, because you actually, you actually do want to do the deletion argument. But you want to do the, the deletion argument while being aware that you, you actually do better on deletion. So deletion is more effective. All right, so this is what Gunderson, Rodel, and Sidorenko did. I can say in a few minutes, very, very briefly, without going into too much detail, what it is that myself and uh, Cosman and Dimitri do. So our vertex set is uh, now, well, again, we have three sets, but now all three sets are actually copies of FQ to the S. But we don't actually need the first one to be, but we might as well. Um, OK, uh, and our edge set is we choose or random 
multilinear polynomials, uh, P1 up to PR. Uh, I won't go into it. There's a few, there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, essentially, the cleanest way, the way in which we do it in the paper is to take the tensor product of a linear polynomial on each set. But um, I won't go into this too much. All right, so we take all random multilinear polynomials. The previous ones had been random polynomials as well. Um, and uh, so we connect um, uh, x1 up to, uh, or x1, x2, x3 here. If p1 of x1, x2, x3 is equal to, et cetera, is equal to zero. Okay. Um, actually, in practice, we make it equal to one. But it doesn't actually matter. Uh, all right, so again, what's the situation? Well, again, we have now copies of fq to the s. But now it's sort of linear in all possible directions, OK? So the point is that if we now have a copy of, of k222, then actually, because it's multilinear in every direction, I know that um, from this side, um, everything here gives, gives hyperplanes over here. So all of these correspond to hyperplanes. So the intersection is, again, some linear subspace. So we're either getting a point or a line or a plane or so on. But it's also true in the other directions. So actually, because we have a K22 in this direction, we know that, again, there's an intersection of hyperplanes over here. So actually having a, um, a K222 means that actually we have loads of K222s. We actually have a line here, and we have a line here, and we have a line here. So as soon as we have a K22, K222, we actually have loads of them. We have Q cubed instead, um, or the Q to the six. So, so one K222 actually implies that you have Q to the six copies of K222. Um, so you're getting something more efficient. So what is the removal process here? Well, the removal process is I now just fix a point here, and then I remove everything containing that point. So, so if I do that, so let me actually do it out like this. So if I remove all of these, then I delete Q squared edges. But the number of K4, K222s I'm getting for that, so um, I get Q to the four possible K222s. So because um, I'm basically choosing the number of possible ways of getting two over here and two over here. So in this, it's again more efficient. So the previous deletion process was uh, deleting uh, Q copies of K222 for every edge. This is now deleting Q squared copies for, for every edge. So, so it's actually way more efficient. And at heart, this is what's going on within the proof. Um, so in practice, there's a nice slick way to write it in terms of, uh, of tensor products. But, um, but I won't I won't go into it too much. At the heart of it, I forgot to mention, is the fact that you can again show that the expected number of edges is what it should be, and the expected number of K222s is what it should be. So you, you expect that you're able to do a deletion process, but it's a more efficient deletion process. OK. That's essentially all I wanted to say. But let me end with one, one question. So the question I wanted to end with is that we don't know how to do the same thing for KTT. So, um, so the extremal number of n KTT is known to be big O of n to the 2 minus 1 over t. But the best known lower bound um, is essentially omega of n to the 2 minus 2 over t plus 1 plus some uh, log factors. So coming from a KGT free process. Um, the question is improve this. So um, if I improve this to epsilon to some epsilon greater than zero. Because if you did that, then again, by this fairborn mckinley samity result, you would actually have a countering result for KTT free graphs, which is uh, a wide open problem. OK, so I'll, uh, I think I've run my 40 minutes, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, David, for this very nice talk. So let's all um, give a round of applause. Or... <laughs>
We have time for questions. So do people have questions? You can just talk, I think, or raise your hand and I'll David, can you say something about what goes wrong for KTT? Because it, I mean, it looks yeah. very promising. Oh, it looks really promising. Yeah, no, I've, I've tried many, many times. So, um, so you need two things, right? Um, so the first thing you need is you need this expectation calculation to go through. Okay, so, so for that expectation calculation to go through, you, you need some non-trivial lower bound on the degrees of the polynomials you're using. Um, so to control things of size t, you sort of need polynomials of size t. And the intersection of, of hypersurfaces of size t, their intersection will tend to be something like Bezu will give something like t to the t. So trying to maintain both this independence property and the property that it intersects in a very, very small number of points is, is hard. The reason why this works is because we can use linear spaces and because linear spaces have the property that you know, the intersection of a bunch of linear spaces is either one or huge. If you go to any higher degree polynomials, then you automatically get it's like two to the two to the power of the number of, of hypersurfaces or huge, but two to the power is not enough. Um, so those linear spaces really help you by the fact that they intersect in at most one space. This is basically why the whole thing works, is because of, of linear subspaces. I see. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Just to clarify, the, the corollary that you'd get is you would see that the num you get an upper bound on the number of uh, box-free de-uniform hypergraphs, which is two to the constant times the extremal number, yes. as opposed to, I guess, uh, Wojtek, uh, Samiti, and Yoshi, in his thesis, would be, I guess, with Yoshi Balog, had the upper bound, the Kovary Shostron bound in the exponent, so two to the big O, but... Yeah, so that's Point actually, if, you, if that. you look at this Ferber mckinley Samati paper, they also show that if you have an upper bound for, for this extremal number, then, and Gwyneth can probably say more than I can about this, then you actually get two to the power of whatever the, the bound for the extremal number actually is. So, um, so there is a more general result in that direction. So if it's true that the extremal number is given by the upper bound, which I really don't believe actually, um, then, then that would be a, a correct thing. I actually think even here, um, I mentioned way back up here that for D equals three, uh, the upper bound is this uh, n to the three minus a quarter and the lower bound is n to the three minus a third. I would conjecture that the lower bound is actually correct rather than the upper bound. Um, so, so the upper bound comes from some, um, you know, from some simple double counting argument, the lower bound seems to be the best you can possibly do using some linear spaces. Um, and the, you can formalize that argument as well in certain ways. Um, and maybe there's some cleverer way to do it without linear spaces, but I'm not sure I believe there is. Um, yeah. But you believe, uh, you guess the answer is somewhere between the two bounds, not the- It's not completely bounds. impossible. I, I sort of, I think I'd be bold enough to conjecture that it's actually three minus a third. Um, ah, sorry, um, uh, I was talking about the, the KTT. Oh, for KTT, sorry. the answer is, uh, for any T greater than or equal to four, the answer is probably less than N squared minus one over T. But I'd say it's, it's probably some power between, yeah. But honestly, I genuinely have no idea. I see no reason why it should be equal to the upper bound. Um, probably there's something where there's like a two-part thing where you can prove that all examples have to be of a certain variety. And then you show that actually anything of that variety can't actually meet the bound. Um, but we're, we're so far from doing anything like that. Um, we just don't, even for C4, we don't even understand what the extremal constructions are. But, you, but you'll be in, in, interested in improvement in the lower bound, not just because of the application, but also because otherwise it really might be true. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise it really might be true. I, I actually, just as I stated that, it might be that there's some, it might be that there's some sort of box-free process that can be applied in this random setting that it also gains you some logs, but. Yeah, um, I'm sure you can gain logs, but. Yeah, you might be able to gain some oh, logs, no, but, but yeah. yeah. The historical question, the gunderson rodel sidorenko paper, is that the first place where these random algebraic 
ideas were used for Toronto type problems or? No, actually. So there's an earlier paper by Matushek um, where he uses random polynomials as well. So he proves, what does he prove? He, he does some Zarenkevich type problem and he shows that the bound for K3T is, um, I, I can't remember what the exact statement is, but essentially the Matushek paper is from 97. He's applying it to some shat, dual shatter functions, um, but he proves essentially some result, some non-trivial result about some asymmetric Zarenkevich using random polynomials. But all he does is observe that if you take, um, so Bezu, if you just have two polynomials, two bivariate polynomials, says that um, they have to share a common factor or they have a bounded number of solutions, or you know, the solutions is at most the product of their degrees. Um, so, um, so you need you need more than that to go further to use more polynomials than that. But this seems to be the sort of mother of these things. This like this paper here, the Gunderson, Riddle, Sidorenko, and this Matushek both have these ideas long before they they started to come up recently. Yeah, I, I was not aware. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think we should. Um, I should hand over to Canada, but you can go on asking unofficial questions in the 10 minutes, of course. <laughs> so.